Now I'd like to uh, introduce you to our first speaker, Sheikh James Jimmy E. Jones is a tenured associate professor of world religions with a concurrent appointment in African studies at Manhattanville College, Purchase, New York, where he is founding co-coordinator of the Center for Middle East Understanding. He is currently the academic director of the Summer Arabic Quran Immersion Program for Americans at Cairo's Al-Azhar University, where he has served for the past five years. Professor Jones is writing Research and lecture activities are focused on Muslim American identity development and conflict resolution. Dr. Jones, a visiting professor at Cordoba University's Graduate School of Islamic and Social Science, Ashburn, VA. He has lectured at, taught in or consulted to many institutions in Bahrain, Bosnia, Bermuda, Egypt, Jerusalem, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Trinidad, Tobago, the United Arab Emirates, United Kingdom, and the United States. His latest publication is a chapter in the recently released book in 2009, Peace Building by Between and Beyond Muslims and Evangelical Christians, edited by Dr. Muhammad Abu Naima and Dr. David Augsburger. A member of the American Academy of Religion, Dr. Jones holds a bachelor's degree from Hampton University, a master's degree from Yale University Divinity School, and a doctorate of ministry degree from Hartford Seminary. Born in Baltimore, MD, Jimmy Jones embraced Islam in 1979. He lives in New Haven, Connecticut, where he is an active leader of Masjid al-Islam's community development project. He's going to be speaking today on a topic from Christianity to Islam. I know you're going to enjoy it. I certainly will enjoy it, inshallah. So please welcome Sheikh Jimmy E. Jones. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalat, wassalam ala rasulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. After praising Allah, or praising the Creator, and sending blessings upon this Prophet, his last Prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, I'd like to first of all thank the people of India for welcoming me for this my first visit and making me feel very, very, very comfortable in your home. I would also like to thank the Islamic Research Foundation for its invitation to involve me in what is one of the world's largest and spectacular efforts to re-educate the Muslims on the one hand and reintroduce Islam to the non-Muslims on the other hand. May Allah reward them all for their efforts. Stephen Portero, in his book entitled Religious Literacy, and is one of several books, I'm a college professor, as was pointed out before by trade, so uh, if you're taking notes, you might want to take down the books that I offer in my discussion, because in this short uh, talk, we won't be able to get into depth into many issues, and these books, both by Muslims and non-Muslims, but mainly by non-Muslims, because we're talking about from Christianity to Islam, mainly by non-Muslims will give you further insight into the things that I'm saying here this morning. So Stephen Potero, uh, in his book, Cultural Religious Literacy, makes the following statement, maybe more or maybe less. He says, when you look at the United States of America, you find a situation in the United States of America where the United States of America is one of the most religious countries on the first face of the earth when measured by two indices. The United States of America is one of the most religious countries on the face of the earth when measured by two indices. One, the number of people who go to religious services, and two, the number of people who over and over and over again 
uh, profess to believe in God. The number is more than 90% as polled by Gallup, G-A-L-L-U-P. In this situation, Professor Prothero finds something that he calls shocking. In this situation, the situation where the United States of America is one of the most religious countries on the face of the earth, he finds a situation that he calls shocking. And this is in the area of the primary title of his book, Religious Literacy. Listen to some of the data that he uses for his assessment. When you look at teenagers in America, only 10% of them can name even one of the five major religions in the world. Only 10% of them can name one of the five major religions in the world. 15% of them at the other end can't name any. When you look in another area, two-thirds of the people in the United States of America believe that the Bible, the book the Christians call the Bible, that's shared by the Christians and the Jews, the book that they call the Bible is a book that answers most or all of life's basic questions. Two-thirds of people in the United States of America believes that the book that they call the Bible answers all or two-thirds of the major questions of life. But on the other hand, only about 50%, only about half of the people in America, over against two-thirds who believe that the Bible has the answers to the basic life questions, only about half of them can name even one, even one of the first four books of the New Testament. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When they ask, you know, they believe, most of them believe, over 66% believe that this book, the Bible, can answer most of life's questions, but apparently they don't know much about it because you ask them to name the first four Gospels, which contain the primary story from the Christian's uh, standpoint of Jesus Christ, they can't name it. This is a serious, shocking situation as far as concerned. And further, he points out that when asked to name, when asked to name the first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis, the majority of people in the United States of America cannot name them. Why the reason for this situation? If we look at another author, Stephen Carter, another Stephen, who's on the faculty of Yale Law School, one of my alma maters, as fact, I didn't finish the law school, but I went there two years. In his book, his classic book, another book, second book, uh, called The Culture of Disbelief. The Culture of Disbelief. This book was written in 1993. It's a classic in the area of understanding the religious dynamics in the United States. Professor Carter makes three important points out of several. Number one, that people in the United States who are religious are encouraged to treat their religion as a hobby, H-O-B-B-Y. That people in the United States who are religious are encouraged to treat their religions as a hobby, H-O-B-B-Y. The second thing is that there is an effort, an attempt to drive religion from the public square. That is to say that if you say that you take a position on a political issue of the day, say health care in the United States right now, which is a hot issue, and you say that the reason that I'm going to do this is because I believe in God, then from the perspective of the average American, their eyes will roll back, according to Professor Carter, and they will not like the idea of you bringing religion into what's called the public square. The third point that he makes that's uh, appropriate to what we're discussing here is that we in the United States of America have misunderstood the First Amendment. That is, the First Amendment that keeps the state out of the business of religion really says, in essence, that the state shouldn't establish re religion. It's called the Establishment Clause was meant to protect religion from the state, not the state from religion. 
and that we've got it all backwards. Why am I talking about these two books? The one, Religious Literacy, the other one, Stephen Carter's Culture of Disbelief, and the conversation about From Christianity to Islam, a graduate of two uh, Christian seminary speaks. The reason I'm talking about these two books is that that's the context in which I grew up, a situation where most of us in the United States of America are religious illiterates. Most of us are religious illiterates. Not only are we illiterate about other people's religions, most of us, and that I would say from my experience of teaching young people coming into college, it's true because I teach in a world religions department, it hasn't changed since Dr. Carter, uh, Professor Carter wrote his book in 1993, and it hasn't changed since the 2007 book that's come out. So most of us are religiously illiterate, right, number one. And number two, uh, one of the reasons I believe this way is because people are encouraged not to put religion in the center of their lives in the United States of America. They're encouraged to treat it as a hobby. So what I'd like to do in my topic, from Christianity to Islam, a graduate of Christian Seminary Speaks, is talk about five shuns. And by shun, I mean T-I-O-N. Strange, well, way to spell shun, but listen to me. Five shuns, connections, reflections, rejections, redirection, revolution. Five shuns, connections, reflections, rejections, redirections, and revolution. Friendly message by Dr. Zakir. Old Age Home. Al Quran, Surah Al Isra, chapter number 17, verses number 23 and 24 says, Your Lord has decreed that you worship none but Him and that you be kind to parents. Whether one or both of them attain old age in your life, say not a word of contempt. Do not say off to them, nor repel them but address them in terms of honor and out of kindness lower to them the wing of humility and say my lord bestow on them your mercy even as they cherished me in childhood there is no place for old age home in islam be stevie the solution for humanity the month of fasting the month of spiritual development the month of self-control the month of monitoring one's own self. The month of offering Taravi. Ramadan. Rejoice Ramadan round the year. Join in to witness the congregational prayers of Taravi recorded from Medina, led by Imam Sheikh Ali bin Abdul Rahman Al Hudafi, Imam Sheikh Abdul Mahsin Al Qasim, Imam Sheikh Hussein Al Sheikh. Imam Sheikh Salah Al Budair Taravi Next on Peace TV The first shun is connection. One of the reasons why the move from Christianity to Islam was relatively easy in some ways, hard in some other ways, but easy in some ways, is that there's a connection between Christianity and Islam. In an earlier talk in the same hall, I talked about the fact that Christians and Muslims, and parenthetically the Jews, are biological, linguistic, geographical, ethical, theological cousins. Biology, because in the Muslim narrative, we trace our lineage, both the Christians and the Muslims and the Jews trace their lineage back to Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him. We say linguistic because the founding languages, the founding languages from a linguistic point of view of these religions, Hebrew for the Jews, uh, Jesus Christ spoke Aramaic and some Hebrew, and Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, spoke Arabic. 
All of these languages belong to the Semitic language group. They're cousins, right? So it's biological, linguistic, geographical. They come from the same part of the world, what we call the Middle East today. Bethlehem, Nazareth, these are places that we know to be in the Middle East. Mecca, Medina, in the Middle East, Jerusalem. These are all places that are in the Middle East and in the middle of conflict today. So they're biological, linguistic, geographical, ethical, and we use the example of the Ten Commandments that Muslim Christians and Jews generally agree, except on the matter of the Sabbath, particularly for the Muslims, with the Ten Commandments you find in Deuteronomy and Exodus. And they are theological cousins because all three of these ways of life profess to be monotheistic. All three of these ways of life profess to be monotheistic. They all profess to believe in one God. As we shall see, it's expressed very differently in Christianity than it is in Islam. So that's the connection between the two. They're cousins. They come from the same part of the world, similar languages, similar ethical systems, and similar theological worldviews. The second part is reflections. In looking at this second part, I like to offer that my context from which I came in Christianity was the Southern Black Baptist context. The context from which I came in Christianity was called the Southern Black Baptist context. That is, I was raised in the South, even though I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, I was raised in Roanoke, Virginia. I was raised in the South, and I went to church, went to Sunday school, went to Bible study, went to choir rehearsal. I went to all of these things at High Street Baptist Church in Roanoke, Virginia. And so this is a Southern Black Baptist context. And one thing you need to understand about the Black or African American ex religious experience in the United States of America is that it's very expressive, very expressive. That is, if somebody is giving a sermon, there's call and response. Amen, tell it, preach, talk, that kind of thing. And it's often built around music because it's part of that expressiveness. My existential understanding of myself, my understanding of who I was as a Christian at a particular time, was to a large extent shaped by the music that I heard and the lyrics that were embedded in that music. My existential understanding of myself that is, my personal understanding of what it meant to be a Christian when I thought I was a Christian was to a great extent determined by the music I heard and uh, the words embedded in that music. As a side note to you parents out there, we are now very much in oral, O-R-A-L, and oral, A-U-R-A-L, society in the United States. I don't know what's happening here in India. I don't know what's happening in other countries, but you hardly walk the streets in the United States without seeing young people connected to iPods, connected to music, connected to uh, music that their favorite music. You, there seems to me that they're connected to this music seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Hear me, whatever the words they're listening to, are very important to their self-understanding as they develop. So you ought to pay attention to this. And so I'm gonna use the example of three pieces of music from my experience as a Christian to show how this shaped and formed who I was and help move me from Christianity to Islam. So next thing we're gonna look at is reflection. And we'll use a Christian hymn known, the name of which is Jesus Loves Me, uh, written by Warner in 1860, and then uh, music was uh, added to it in 1862. And it goes uh, something like this. I hope no one will be offended by me trying to sing it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak and he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. 
for the Bible tells me so. All right. At six years old, I was taught to sing this song over and over and over again in the angelic choir of High Street Baptist Church. What I learned from this song, from singing it and like-minded songs over and over again, was the notion that there was a biblical authority, there was a, an authority, there was a, a authority of the book, before the Bible tells me so. What I learned from this is that God, as I understood it then, Muslims, we would say, we seek refuge from this, but God, as I understand it, loved me. This was affirming me as myself. Jesus loves me, this I know, and the Bible told me so. And so this was very important. This was affirming who I was. It taught me that God loved me, and it also, the underpinning of this was the notion that that God, that creator, was omnipotent and all-powerful, and that made that affirmation even more important to me at that particular time. Upon reflection, this was a very, very important part of my existential understanding. I would argue that the foundation for my love for Allah or my love for Creator was laid then, even though the belief system was incorrect, the foundation was laid at that particular time. And it was a positive relationship with my Creator. It was a positive relationship with my then deen or my way of life, my religion, that helped shape my existential understanding of myself at a very, very young age. So we've looked at connection. That's a reflection. So when did the rejection begin? I offer a second hymn. It's called The Old Rugged Cross. It was penned in 1912, I believe, by an evangelist by the name of Brenner. And by the way, when I was singing these songs, I always thought they were very, very ancient. But you notice, you know, 1862, 1912, and in the name of this hymn is The Old Rugged Cross. Uh, the lyrics go something like this. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and the best for a world of lost sinners were slain. And I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Now, to the extent that Jesus loves me was affirming and uplifting and reinforcing the old rugged cross was just the opposite. It was depressing. It was disempowering. And it was discordant. It was depressing. It was disempowering. And it was discordant. Why do I say this? It's depressing. Understand, even if you use the Christian text as a source, there is no reason to argue that the cross should be the symbol of Christianity, except that the church made it so. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Now, people talk about Christianity being about love, but the cross is the emblem of suffering and shame. How much more depressing can you get? The emblem of suffering and shame. For I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners were slain. Now, why is it disempowering to sing this thing over and over again? For I love that old cross where the dearest and the best for a world of lost sinners were slain. Well, this whole idea of vicarious atonement is an idea that disempowers the individual.